Good afternoon. I'm happy to introduce uh, Father Jerry Whalen from the Gregorian University in Rome. He actually is from Dublin, so uh, but he teaches in Rome. He had spent many years in Africa and Kenya uh, as a pastor there and, and working in, in Africa for 14 years. So uh, we're very happy to have him come today and to speak about nonviolent peacemaking. I've known Father Jerry for a long time. We, were, we met at uh, the Woodstock Theological Center in uh, Washington, D.C. We were both worked on the work of Father Bernard Lonergan. And um, one of the thoughts I had about Father Jerry, I remember he, he once talked about a course uh, that he took at Boston University. And um, the teacher was talking about something to do with understanding. And uh, as he was listening, he said to himself, he doesn't have it right. <laughs> And it was a moment he remembered and he talked about later. And uh, if you know anything about Abraham Maslow, he says, we have these peak experiences that we remember and that form us. And I've come to the conclusion that a lot of university education is having these special moments of insight. I can remember being in Father Hollywell's class here at Seton Hall University and hearing him quote St. Augustine, uh, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And that was a peak experience. I still remember that class that I had here at Seton Hall University. So a lot of what Father Lonergan talks about and Father Whalen will be talking about today are remembering those special moments that form us and form our lives and, and make us who we are and make us who we come to be. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Father Whalen, but I'm going to ask the Dean of the School of Diplomacy to actually do the real introduction and, and talk about a conference that will be coming up in October on peacemaking. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Dean uh, Andrea Bartoli from the School of Diplomacy. It's, um, it's beautiful to be here and uh, it's beautiful to share a few words uh, before um, Professor Wellen, uh, Father Wellen, will speak. Um, <laughs> Monsignor Lidi uh, facilitated many conversations. Many of us are here because of uh, those conversations. And uh, one of the last conversations is in, in inviting uh, Father Willem to take on or at least uh, uh, address or, or engage with a project that uh, some of us are exploring around Magisterium Pacis. All popes after Leo XIII have been very consistently advocating for peace in very difficult circumstances. Millions of people were killed in World War I, World War II, in the war in Iraq, in Afghanistan. But the Catholic popes have been very consistent in being against those wars. And they were not against something, they were for something. They had an idea of how human order comes about and why ordering in love is actually a responsibility of each of us, something we cannot delegate to someone else. So I suggested to Dick uh, that uh, in consideration of Cardinal Turkson availability of coming, the Catholic uh, nonviolent initiative uh, work that was done prior, Seton Hall could embark in a three-year project that will engage Pope Francis, Benedict, and John Paul II in conversations so that we can hear what these popes have to say, not just as an exercise of learning, but also of encountering ourselves and why 
we hear sometimes and sometimes we don't. In scripture, it's very, very clear that the Lord has a lot to say about the human capacity not to hear what is uh, clearly stated. And uh, it's clearly a capacity that we have in our own heart. And the two examples that Monsignor Lidi just shared are very interesting because he was mentioning one reaction of Father Will and to say, I don't think that he's got it right. And his reaction to Augustine given by a professor, because one was an ascent, I agree with you, Augustine is speaking about me, I am restless unless, until I am in God. And the other one is, I am hearing what this professor is saying so precisely that I'm actually questioning what the professor is saying, and I think he's wrong, he doesn't have it right. Eh? So he's exercising a very different form of listening. But I think that this is the beauty of the university, is that we encounter consist, co continuously this responsibility of thinking, this responsibility of assenting, this responsibility of deciding, is this true or not? Is this good or not? Is this important or not? Is this relevant or not? And our decisions is actually fundamental and constitutive. So I'm very delighted that I am uh, with you listening to this nonviolent peacemaking lecture that clearly comes from a long trajectory in conversation with Bernard Lonegren and Robert Doran and invites us into a future that uh, must be more attentive in listening and understanding. I am delighted to be here, thankful to Monsignor Lidi, thankful to uh, Father Whelan, and I'll give him the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm, I've, I've been to Seton Hall a few times before. Uh, my brother lived in Chatham until recently and has moved with his um, family down to Houston. Um, Father Liddy is correct in saying we both studied Lonergan, uh, but the fact is I studied Father Liddy, uh, Monsignor Liddy, on Lonergan. Uh, so I, when we met in, in Woodstock uh, in 95, um, I think, uh, the, uh, I was thrilled to see that uh, Monsignor Liddy was there because I had used him a great deal in my doctorate, uh, the, a biographical study of Lonergan in, in a number of respects. Uh, also, Monsignor Bartoli, uh, I have known and respected highly uh, the, from appearing at Lonergan um, conferences, first of all, but also I know the San Egidio community a little bit uh, in Italy, with which um, uh, Professor Bartoli is concerned. And I lived for 14 years in Africa, and I knew the good work the San Egidio community had done in some remarkable peacemaking in Mozambique and Sudan, for example. And to hear that somebody was making links to Lonergan from that San Egidio experience was very exciting for me, so it's an honour to be here. Um, and I will continue now <coughs> with a, an introduction. The just uh, the I've already heard about this. I, I was delighted to be invited into uh, doing something propedeutic for this October conference that uh, will start the three-year process that uh, Professor Bartoli is talking about. Uh, so, a description of the conference that stuck a uh, sentence of the description that stuck in my mind. <coughs> Individuals need to embody the vocation of peace in oops, no, that's right, uh, of peace in their personal lives and the various communities to which they belong. So there's this a kind of paradox. You're talking about global affairs, not least um, war and peace, and you're talking about your own interiority at the same time. So that's especially what I note in that comment. Uh, the I've already. Um, put on the, uh, the title, that I want to make a contribution explaining in general terms how Lonergan, Lonergan's epistemological and methodological thought is relevant to this. But others are working on that as well. Um, the, I don't know uh, if you've seen this book, uh, Professor Bartoli says that he advertises it, uh, Transforming Conflict Through Insight, Kenneth Melchin and Cheryl Pickard. Uh, so 
I'll, I'll arrive at that point at a certain stage of my talk. Uh, the, so I highly recommend it. It's terribly impressive. It's a sub-genre within Lonergan studies to engage with uh, conflict resolution. If there's a particular addition I want to make uh, in this talk, it is to uh, notice that a fellow called Robert Doran, who was actually my doctoral director in uh, Toronto, uh, a, a Jesuit of a younger generation than Lonergan uh, fr from um, Wisconsin, uh, adds something to Lonergan, in my opinion, uh, even at a fundamental epistemological level that is relevant all the more so for, for peacemaking. That is a notion of psychic conversion. Uh, some of you who've studied a bit of Lonergan perhaps might have heard that Lonergan speaks about religious conversion, moral conversion, intellectual conversion. And now Doran adds a notion of psychic conversion that I accept and I use, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, um, now this is actually the email that Monsignor Liddy sent me. Uh, the, I was all set to give a talk on a much more easy topic for me that I have given before, and uh, Monsignor starts to um, constrain me to try to feed into this process that is already present in, in uh, Seton Hall. So let's just notice something of uh, his very perspicacious comments on what I had been telling him about what I'm already studying these days uh, and how it connected to this peace-making topic. <coughs> The notion of psychic conversion and symbols as a way of getting concrete conversions to peacemaking, even in universities where there's a lot of fighting. Anything Pope Francis has said about this question mark, using Lonergan's notion of conversion in general to illuminate peacemaking on the personal and political level. So it was Monsignor Liddy who really prompted me to, to formulate my topic for this talk. Um, the, uh, I have uh, a book coming on Pope Francis and Lonergan um, that uh, is implicit in what Monsignor Liddy was saying, but not really Pope Francis and Doran. Uh, the book wasn't long enough for me to get on to uh, uh, Doran. So in truth, I won't be saying much about Pope Francis. Uh, the uh, question time, you're most welcome. Uh, there's all sorts of connections. I'm very enthusiastic about these links. but. Uh, the, I understand a number of students will be leaving uh, for another class at 5 p.m. I expect to take about uh, uh, 35 more minutes. Uh, so uh, I'll do the talking, and we'll, then I'll be staying around for uh, any length of questions that people want. We could get on to the Pope Francis link, perhaps, in question time, but uh, not really in, in my main talk. So uh, I hope you'll forgive me uh, if I talk quite a bit about myself now. <coughs> Uh, the, I can at least invoke uh, Monsignor Liddy, who does something similar. Uh, the, if we're talking about interiority, and just this sort of paradoxical link between uh, the individual conversion of a person and the significance for historical change that that person and in community can then be part of, I think it's appropriate that individuals do a little bit of almost a St. Augustine of Hippo uh, 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 autobiography account. Uh, the point is, of course, I'm making a point about what is psychic conversion, how it adds to what Lonergan talks about, how it's relevant for the redemption of history, as I'll talk a bit about uh, more. But if you'll permit me, still in an introductory mode, really, um, talk about my own experience, and ultimately, therefore, what psychic conversion means, has meant in my uh, life. Um, when I was your age, you, uh, you stu undergraduates here, I was uh, studying economics in Trinity College in Dublin. I was hanging on to my Catholic faith, more or less. Uh, I knew I had to go to a, a certain kind of youth mass uh, that was uh, on a Sunday night if I was going to hang on to my faith, because uh, I found a lot of other masses not helpful. Uh, the, but uh, I was also able to acknowledge myself, I was mostly lazy. So uh, the, uh, st tried to keep going. Um, the, after one of these masses, there was a talk from a, a lady that I wouldn't usually listen to, frankly, of a certain age, uh, the, uh, who spoke about the organization called Pax Christi, uh, which is a, an organization of active nonviolence. I was very touched by it. Uh, she talked about the nuclear Cold War, uh, political lobbying done by Pax Christi. But mostly she talked about prayer and how we have to be 
individuals of peace reconciled with ourselves and our own demons if we are ever to be able to proceed in a peacemaking way and how you can be proposing the right policy but doing it in such a way that you're almost contradicting yourself. So there, there's a method of peacemaking where the medium is the message, she was saying, that the, uh, you have to incarnate in some way the kind of message of peace that you're trying to communicate in specifics, in its social manifestation, policy kind of manifestation. So I was very touched by this. Uh, I joined up. I remember it cost me £10, uh, which didn't come easy uh, in those days, uh, the 70s. Um, the, so, uh, now, next step was joining the Jesuits after novaship. Uh, I'm really grateful to the formation that the Jesuits gave me. I had ten more years before they let me loose on anybody uh, as an ordained uh, priest. Uh, two years of novaship. So the spiritual exercises, the 30-day retreat you have probably heard about. Um, again, there is this sense of zeal for action in the world and caution about am I wise enough to do anything. So there's a call to humility, an interior examination of motives. As you are very active in the world and uh, concerned for the poor, concerned for, for, for society. So again this paradox. Uh, the <coughs> uh, Just on the humility, see I don't want to confess all my sins uh, in public, but uh, the I remember the, there's a prayer called the Kingdom, Prayer of the Kingdom, uh, in the spiritual exercises. It's Luke 4. You just imagine yourself in the scene of Luke 4. Jesus coming to Nazareth saying, I have come to bring good news to the poor, uh, bring liberty to captives, uh, sight to the blind. And you're asked to ask, do you buy this? Do you sign up for this project? And I remember f feeling an enormous amount of zeal that uh, I did want to be a Jesuit and commit myself to this sort of uh, project. Shortly afterwards, uh, I'm imagining Jesus in uh, different gospel scenes, and I'm getting uh, a preaching and healing, and I'm getting really annoyed that everybody's paying attention to him and not to me. And, and I suddenly realized that I don't like this, and I, this has never been my life up to now, that uh, I have always been seeking to do good things with myself at the centre and myself getting praised and thanked as a result. So it won't surprise you that it was off to psychotherapy for me. <laughs> the, uh, so in fact, it, we couldn't all have been crazy because all the novices did psychotherapy in the second year of novicship. Uh, and the, um, it was a remarkable experience of staying in the spirit of the spiritual exercises and in a sense praying them more deeply than we had even during the 30 days. Uh, the, I came, again here is where I don't want to confess all my sins, but uh, confronting some behaviours that, it's not just it was getting me into trouble with the novice master, it was irritating the living daylights out of my fellow novices. Uh, there were certain patterns of behaviour that I had to acknowledge were really not good. The, and then with therapy, uh, passing this scary bridge of recognizing that, look, I had rationalizations for what I had been doing, but my actual motives for what I had been doing were unknown to me. So I had unconscious motivations. I've already mentioned, for example, seeking attention. Uh, the, there were others. Uh, the, uh, our, I, I had mo behaviors being driven more by unconscious motivations than I, that I, had, than I had been acknowledging uh, up to that date. <coughs> the, um, it just, I don't know if any of you have, have done therapy. This is very important to what I'm explaining about psychic conversion. The moment of fear uh, that you can experience when you suddenly realize you're not in as much in control of your own actions as you thought you were. That I employ masking narratives for my behavior that uh, uh, disguise some of the real motives. And then exploring some of those motives and recognizing hurts from the past that there are aspects of my behavior that are inauthentic and they come from a woundedness. So I need somehow to visit the sources of that woundedness. Uh, the, so like the story has a happy ending, so to speak, but I want to emphasize the moment of fear that uh, when you're in the middle of just opening the window to the fact that there's stuff down there influencing me. And if I've spotted one of my motives uh, that, that needs working on, what more will there be? Uh, 
what, can, what rock do I have for my self-identity? Uh, here it was very helpful for having done the spiritual exercises because I had actually had a very strong experience of God's unconditional love. So to take the risk in prayer of saying, the, look, I let God's unconditional love into this area. And of course it remains unconscious in a, to a considerable degree, but I was praying in a more real way in the second year of the novitiate than I'd ever done in my life before. And it had to do with this therapeutic insight that there are realms of my motivation that are unconscious to me and are doing me no good. So uh, unconscious motivation to authenticity. The, uh, so this just briefly um, anticipating what I'll be saying in a more explanatory way uh, later in the, in the talk. Unconscious motivation and authentic self-transcendence. So Bob Doran says that uh, psychic conversion is the process that I more or less can understand from my novitiate experience. You know, we're all a bit hesitant to say I'm completely religiously converted, morally converted, intellectually, psychically. But I understood what he was saying by saying that psychic conversion involves finding ways to help the unconscious cooperate with my authentic self-transcendence. And then to notice two things uh, about this. I've, I've only spoken so far about the, uh, the way that the unconscious can block my authentic self-transcendence. But there's another area which uh, was central to the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. Uh, discernment of spirits, you've probably heard about. Uh, how am I feeling as in an active life? I'm aware that I'm subject to both the consolation that comes from the Holy Spirit the desolation that comes from the enemy of human nature. And the real clincher for discernment of spirits is it's towards decision making. I will recognize that when I'm in a state of consolation, confirmed by my spiritual director, I can make decisions that are in keeping with the will of God. Now we're not talking about sinning, not sinning. We're talking about the whole realm of what am I going to do with my life? Ignatius calls it the election. The, uh, so discernment of spirits, to start with, concerns election of a way of life. I'm going to get, mar get married, I'm going to be a doctor, a lawyer, I'm going to join the Jesuits. There's no saying, there's no rules about that. There's a whole area of, it's kind of an aesthetic choice. What just seems more beautiful to me to make of myself? Uh, my sister told me about being proposed marriage by uh, her her uh, boyfriend really not being sure, knowing all his uh, uh, defects. And she tells us all on a regular basis what they are. Uh, the, but having a dream in the night and waking up certain that he was the one. And they're, they've got eight grandchildren now, the, uh, the two of them. So that was her. You know, who's to say who you marry? Uh, who's to say what career you choose? It's got something to do with the unconscious. It, it wells up in your affectivity. There's this whole way in which the unconscious can be freed from being an obstacle to your self-transcendence, to being a positive resource. Uh, if you've heard of Rosemary Houghton, a spirituality theology writer, has written a book called The Passionateness of Being that um, Lonergan liked a great deal. And uh, I believe that that notion of the passion, the passionateness of being, is a reference really to the way the unconscious can be mobilized as well as the conscious uh, aspects of self-transcendence to direct a life. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going back then to my academic training. So in a sense I've, I've explained a little bit of the essence in some ways of what I'm trying to do here today, which is psychic conversion based on my personal account. And of course the point is to invite you to think similar thoughts. Um, but I'm heading towards a more technical explanation of Lonergan's thought and Doran's thought and its relevance for peacemaking now. Uh, the, so as I went into academic formation, um, I was using my background in economics. Uh, I was very motivated to uh, work for the poor and to go to Africa, in fact, where I did go for 14 years. Uh, the, so, uh, but this experience I'd had in formation in the novitiate may be just a little bit cautious that not everything that glitters is gold, so to speak, even in social justice ministry. And I became a little bit cautious about quite a few of my fellow Jesuits. And I would, I would hazard to say, in some of the 
general tone of the way the society of Jesus was in the 1970s and 1980s. A certain immature step towards how to link faith and justice, as they said. That there was something more to be uh, understood and embraced here. Uh, just quite uh, I mean, uh, unkindly, uh, the way I put it myself, was coming out of the novaship, I'd see some Jesuits at uh, the um, uh, active, especially in the social justice ministry, and I'd say, they should go back to the novaship. They should go back to my novice master. I can see in them some of, for example, the attention-seeking uh, that, that, I, that I was involved in. At the, uh, so a caution that is a discerning caution about even work such as Option for the Poor, the most noble uh, uh, working for others. Um, so that's good old Karl Marx there, you see. I think implicitly, without meaning to, there was a slipping into a certain um, Marxist kind of thinking for quite a lot of people that wanted to transform society. Conversely, these were the years of Pope John Paul II, the Solidarity Movement, and the clarity of that uh, Pope John Paul had, that Wojtyla had as a philosopher, about conflictual change over against the communists in Poland, always by peaceful methods. Uh, so he had developed a whole philosophy uh, to support that. It's why he was so quick-footed as Pope to say yes to solidarity the moment it had its first strike. Uh, you know, Vec Lec Vec Malesa, the solidarity movement. Before many of you were born, I understand now, but it was exciting uh, at times for me. Active nonviolence, a different way to change that is not Marxist and it clearly was not Marxist when it was in, a, in Poland that was opposing communism. Now, there's a two-semester course here that I'm not going to uh, really get into, but in my academic work I became aware of continuity with the Pax Christi organization that I had uh, known, uh, that there is a discipline of active nonviolence that is taught, and I don't know, perhaps it, it is taught here, I hope so, in, in Seton Hall, um, this wasn't the central line of my studies. I, I would specialise in Lonergan, but I was aware here of um, the... So this whole list, Daniel O'Connell of Ireland, uh, Henry David Thoreau, I hope you know him quite well, civil disobedience, both literature, but very much this uh, act of non-violent philosophy for how do you change an unjust state in a democratic state where you want to observe the, uh, the rules of, of the democratic state sort of, even if they, you, you're put into jail for, for active uh, non-violent protest, but it, it's, it's within democracy. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. I don't know if you've heard of the, uh, the Philippine People Power Revolution that overthrew General Marcos in 1986. Uh, and the point was, there was a self-aware method that they were trained in, how not to be violent with the police, even if they're knocking you on the head when you're making a peaceful protest, uh, this kind of thing. Um, Daniel O'Connell, the Irishman, I was delighted to hear, is a sort of founder figure. Uh, just one comment on him. He witnessed the effects of the French Revolution. He was an Irish nationalist uh, around eight, uh, late 1700s, uh, of a fairly rich Irish family as Catholics go. Uh, the, but so very committed to work for independence of Ireland from Britain, and very aware of many injustices. Uh, the, the 1700s were a rough century for Catholics in, in Britain and Ireland. Uh, but he was taken aback by seeing the consequences of violence after um, the French Revolution, especially in fact in Napoleon. Um, the, so from scratch in some ways he determined to adopt a, a method that would employ the, the instruments of British democracy. Uh, and uh, while there was all sorts of distortions in elections, it was still possible to get Irish members of Parliament elected who would then try to block the business of, of Parliament unless concessions were made to the, uh, the Irish uh, independence movement. Anyway, that's just a little bit of kind of self-advertising as an Irishman. Uh, the, but, uh, so now I move along to my African years. Um, I, uh, I'll talk more about some of my academic formation as I talk about Lonergan, but I found myself <coughs> not only studying in Africa, uh, uh, but uh, not only teaching full-time theology, but for a period being assigned as pastor to a poor parish in Nairobi. Uh, that's a photograph of it when um, Pope Francis visited. It's the one Jesuit parish in Nairobi. It's in the slums, and he met with representatives of all the slum parishes in Nairobi to give a talk there. 
Of course I was gone for six years, so I, I missed uh, the whole uh, event. But happy, happy six years I was there. I want to talk about two experiences of, of active nonviolence as a pastor of a parish with which I was directly involved. The, um, well, first of all, a prelude to that. There, were, there was a certain organization of priests from the um, uh, poor parishes of Nairobi, the periphery, as Pope Francis says. They brought over people from the Philippines who had been involved in the active nonviolent overthrow of Marcos. It won't surprise you to hear they were shadowed by the Kenyan secret police for all of their two weeks in Kenya. Uh, but they gave us quite a specific training in active nonviolence methods, and especially the history of uh, the, uh, what, what had happened in the Philippines. A uh, very happy event. It really was active nonviolence. Uh, um, but anyway, the, you, know, you never know what's going to happen in parish life from week to week. Uh, but it was in the background, this kind of method of active nonviolence that uh, we had been trained in. One event emerged where uh, we're mostly a poor area, but up on a hill, uh, there is a very rich uh, housing estate, which technically was part of our uh, parish. A great proportion of the people there were Catholics because they'd been educated in the Catholic schools, which were the best schools in Kenya. None of them came to the parish in our uh, uh, church. They went in their cars to a, a, a middle-class uh, parish down the road. The road was a big motorway that led west out, out, of, um, uh, out of Nairobi. Uh, the all, a large number of the population in the slum area had to walk through the rich area to get to the road. The organizing committee, the residence committee, started putting up gates to make a gated community uh, out of their housing estate. And uh, so we made inquiries. There was no legality whatsoever in what they did. If I committed violence here, it was violence against, against some iron posts. Uh, we were instructed by uh, lawyers to uh, take down whatever they built because it wasn't legal. Uh, the, so we also were quite involved in ecumenism. It was, there were a lot of Anglicans in the area. So it was with the, the Anglican ministers that we started to try to open dialogue with the residence committee. And uh, it was quite remarkable. There was one guy there who was a junior minister of government who threatened us with violence, he, that he could send in thugs if he wanted. Uh, the, uh, but we kept the process going. Uh, Next, a very, very sad, tragic event happened. Um, the, there were security guards outside each gate. Uh, there were a crowd of delinquents uh, uh, from the, uh, um, down in the slum who I think had been throwing stones at the security guards. Meanwhile, the son of the chairman of the pastoral council of the Anglican parish was walking back from school. And uh, the security guards were chasing in anger the guys that were running away saw this fellow in his school uniform, the others had not been in a school uniform, and beat him to death. So now the Anglicans were up in arms, uh, and the funeral of the boy occurred. And the father stood at the graveside and appealed to the people not to commit any violence, that uh, this is not Christianity, that you've got to somehow respond returning good for evil. The residence committee heard about this and they cooled down their position in the negotiations with, with, with us. We found a way to agree, in fact, that all they needed to do was block cars that were coming through. It was really uh, thieves coming through in, in, in automobiles uh, that were the problem. So pedestrians could go through in the end. The, um, so I'll just leave it at that as an example. There were, there were other examples where I was more personally involved in, in trying to remember to be Christ-like in positions of conflict and aware that transformation can happen. There can be a moral transformation when you have entered into conflict in the right way on the part of an oppressor, which is uh, what we were confronting on, on certain occasions. Uh, okay. Um, the... Bernard Lonergan. Uh, so this is, I'm aware of time and I know people have to go. Uh, I'm only arriving at the very technical uh, philosophy theology now, but I've covered the basis basically of, of what I'll be explaining in a more academic, method methodological way uh, uh, now. Bernard Lonergan uh, was deeply affected by the uh, um, economic crash of 1929. So he was that age, he was from Canada, uh, the, uh, already a Jesuit. Uh, had studied philosophy, very brilliant, uh, attracted to 
cognitional theory to, to the questions of, of how do we know anything. He recognised that was very important. But at a, an affective level, uh, he, between philosophy and theology, he was brought back uh, from England where he did his philosophy and um, worked in his home area of Montreal and saw friends of his parents queuing at soup kitchens because they were unemployed and hungry. And he was scandalised by this. Uh, he would soon later go for studies in the Gregorian University where I teach in Rome and witness the rise of Mussolini. So he had economic depression, the rise of fascism. And he be felt very committed to try to help society out of this. There is a crisis of civilization that is evident. Now, being the kind of intellectual that he was, he said, this has intellectual roots. For example, I'm convinced, he said, that there were economic mistakes made at the level of theory that influenced government decisions that made the depression a depression in 1929 instead of a, a, a recession. Uh, the, similarly, there's a philosophy of the human person at work in Nazism, in Italian fascism, that's not so very different from the communists in the, the other um, uh, side of the, what, what would later be uh, the Iron Curtain. The, um, the state is more important than the individual. That uh, there is good we're trying to do. Uh, it might, in the case of Nazis, just be for the Aryan people. But basically, we will, you know, to say the least, uh, break eggs to make the omelette. Uh, the, the dignity of the individual did not have a place. And uh, the, there's also a sort of utopia here. We're trying to solve everything here in this life. We're going to attain a perfect society at all costs. But it's the state that will do it, under the control of an elite that knows better than everybody else. So uh, he started working on economics, uh, and uh, the, uh, especially a philosophy of history. As he would write in his book, Insight, which is his mature, work of his maturity uh, later, if you're going to try to intelligently direct history, you have to have an adequate theory of history. You have to have an adequate social analysis, as some people would, would say later, uh, and theological analysis, in fact, of the situation. And a set of intellectual instruments that can help produce kinds of solutions that are necessary in any given situation. So the, now I'm really jumping fast uh, here on the academic front. Uh, the, the Lonergan, quite young while he was still before ordination, said, I want to devote my life to developing a philosophy of history. Um, the, and I don't have time to explain this at great length. He would write his, oh, just two masterworks in his life, an 800 book called Insight, 800 page book called Insight, and a shorter book called Method in Theology. But I'd like to explain by this diagram, I just kind of made this up, uh, the, but it's my best way of, of explaining what's at the heart of, of his thinking. But I hope I've already explained his motivation. I call it his social concern. Uh, the, he talks about, he uses vector analysis. He was a gifted mathematician, amongst other things. Uh, so the, the analogy, the metaphor of vectors to study history. Uh, if you're studying a moving item, let's say a, a rocket going to the moon, uh, the vector analysis, we remember that. I remember that, and I, I didn't uh, love maths as it got up to its higher reaches. Uh, the, so uh, they're a model, an idealized model of forces. You never see a vector in real life. If these are theoretical instruments that you use that when combined, they produce the trajectory that you're already observing and predict its, its further uh, direction. So this is, by analogy, a vectorial analysis of history. So his first principle is uh, to say, if we imagine a situation where everybody was authentic, the, what would history look like? This is the imaginary vector of progress in history. Now, I've sort of put things out of order a bit. The next slide is about his basic epistemology, that we have a process of knowing that passes through experience, understanding, judgment, and decision. So uh, the, uh, but now I'm going back just to say very briefly, the progress, if you had authentic people, 
would still involve a lot of change. There would be processes going on in, in history where science is helping technological innovation, technology is bumping along economic change, politics is involved with distributing the, uh, the, the benefits of, the, uh, of the, what has been produced economically. And uh, culture gives the set of meanings and values that guide the politicians, who in turn direct the economy, uh, especially that. So this is an idealised notion. His economic theory, which he started to work on, was based on, well, an ideal notion of how should an economy uh, work. I won't go into details about that. Progress. It's a process. Next, vector. Inauthentic decisions. We go off the rails personally at any and all of the levels of knowing. Attentiveness, be intelligent, be re reasonable, be responsible. So consequences in society of inauthentic decisions produce a series of decline policies. So now the reality we face is a mixture of a social reality where policies have been decided upon that are sometimes both good and bad and we live with a hodgepodge of progress and decline in our society and in our culture as well. So there's a great need then to have a measure on what is authentic. I'll go again to the next. There should of course be an arrow there and I just don't have the technology to um, draw that arrow uh, through those four levels of consciousness. The, um, so, and then there's a need for, he talks about a cultural elite, not least emanating out of universities, who have a measure of what would be progress for society. What do we actually have? And then, I go back again, this third uh, uh, arrow needs a fair bit of explaining, but to start with, it is that this, these cultured people who are working at their own authentic, uh, authenticity would learn to reverse decline and promote progress in history, in the history around them, in the social structures around them, but first and foremost at a cultural level. Clarify what are the meanings and values that we should be living by. The, uh, and then hope that the consequences for, for more structured policies would follow from that. It's just that we are never authentic, is the catch. Uh, so at a philosophical level, I've been speaking about uh, the um, uh, process of uh, doing this. Uh, the, so really, uh, I'm going, where am I going? Excuse me if I'm giving you a headache with these changes of slides. Redemption comes from Jesus Christ, uh, uh, Lonergan is saying that there, he talks about moral impotence. The human race is caught, left to its own devices. Inauthenticity is stronger than authenticity. Decline is stronger than uh, <coughs> progress in history. Decline sets up vicious pro uh, uh, circles. Above all, what he calls general bias, where you attack the very instruments of intelligence that should be part of the solution. So you abuse as a nerd, as an egghead, anybody who's trying to formulate intelligent solutions at a level of culture and uh, uh, social structures. So the, there is a, he becomes a theologian at this moment and not just a philosopher. He says that it, it's not just a Catholic or Christian uh, event that grace would happen, but there is a supernatural intervention in history. Uh, I see what uh, uh, time is going. Feel free to leave. I understand I've been warned that uh, a number of students have to leave, so uh, as, as you wish in your own time. Uh, the, so the redemption of history that reverses decline and, pro and promotes progress will have to come from communities of God's grace. You can talk about the ins and outs of that. The Christian church is at the heart of this, he certainly believed. United Nations, what are the, even the communal secular uh, institutions that are actually channeling grace into communal reflection? Now, it's, uh, I come to this book. That's the title of this book. Um, this is Lonergan applied to the subgenre of uh, the uh, conflict resolution. It's an excellent book. 
In many ways, it, it is, of course, an, effort, an exercise in confronting the, de the decline in society that represents violence, especially uh, the um, conflicts. I think of Northern Ireland all the time, uh, the uh, Protestants, Catholics fighting each other, loyalists, nationalists. The, um, so very briefly, it's an invitation. First of all, this, is, this book is for training mediators. So these mediators should be part of what Lonergan calls this cultural elite of people who have self-appropriated the structure of their own authenticity and are able to try to then work with communities who will uh, to try to get them to a place of reconciliation and return to progress from the place of decline that where they have got themselves. So uh, the, the mediation process involves the dialogue of parties and above all, it's to trace the steps you took in, the, in this process of decision making. Where might you have gone off the rails to make a violent choice? But then also try to get inside the head of the person that you're in conflict with. So Catholics in Northern Ireland have to try to understand the good that is in Protestants and how their, their historical narrative of, of their own lives includes occasional massacres by, by the Irish Catholics uh, around them. Uh, so the, uh, an empathy for the other position. And uh, then again, I knew some specific people who worked in Northern Ireland, helping groups of Protestants and Catholics write a joint narrative that does justice to the two, the two traditions, recognizes how violence occurred, but finds a way to move forward to a new reconciled position. Uh, the amazing thing in Northern Ireland is that uh, there was a peace agreement. Uh, the, uh, of course, we could talk more about this. Uh, so now uh, it's 4.47, and I'm only now getting to the, um, the main point of my talk in one sense, uh, but I believe I've, I've been covering it also. Robert Doran adds something to this. I've given an explanation of uh, Lonergan's affective commitment to helping history, helping the poor who are suffering from bad economic policies, etc. Uh, but his highly theoretical move then to uh, work on epistemology, philosophy of history. He's convinced that there has to be work at that intellectual level if real and valuable policies will be applied. It's not obvious how do you solve problems of a modern economy, for example, or for that matter, complicated political uh, origins of fascism in the 1930s. Uh, so intelligence, the role of an academic specialist in the process of really elevating history. I've talked about that. But I want to now talk about uh, Bob Doran in this book called Theology and the Dialectics of History. Uh, the, um, just to add, I'm only connecting the dots now between my personal man, uh, testimony that I've given and this more theoretical level. Conversion, especially intellectual conversion, to be authentic in our use of the levels of consciousness is all very well. But what if you're like me as a novice and you have unconscious distortions leading you off the rails? A, a simple uh, intellectual invitation to intellectual conversion isn't going to cut it. So what about the healing of the unconscious interference with the uh, levels of um, uh, consciousness that uh, constitute authenticity. I wrote a book uh, on Lonergan and Doran. You can't really see it, I think. Um, Social Concern in Bernard Lonergan and Robert Doran. I tell kind of two intellectual biographies. Uh, the Lonergan biography, and then I suggest that Robert Doran is in continuity with Lonergan a fellow Jesuit, a kind of anointed son by Bernard Lonergan. He became the uh, curator of the legacy of, of Lonergan for publishing the collected works of Lonergan. As a fellow Jesuit, he did this under obedience or with the permission of Jesuit superiors. Um, but there is this expansion of the notion of psychic conversion that becomes crucial to helping authenticity happen and even to the theory of history. There's an expansion of the theory of progress, decline, and redemption that comes from Doran's edition. So I want to just briefly uh, mention uh, this. I don't know if you know this uh, painting. Uh, Salvador Dali, uh, the Christ of John of the Cross. Uh, it's actually in Glasgow. I got 
permission to uh, use it on the front cover of my book. Um, it's really more about resurrection than it is about crucifixion. You know, we're lucky there isn't a hippopotamus upside down in this painting, being that it comes from Salvador Dali. Uh, this is his very Christian Catholic phase at the end of his life. Um, but it's really about the, the value of the cross breathing life onto history. Uh, if you see, there's a lake and a boat there. Um, it's, in truth, it's, it's Galilee. It's John 21, uh, the, the resurrection scene to the disciples after fishing all night. Uh, but I understand it also to be the, the, risen, the crucified and risen Christ hovering over the course of history, redeeming it. Uh, and that's already Bernard Lonergan. He talks about the law of the cross as a, a, a distinct theme that comes from the theological tradition where we become Christ-like, that uh, in, on the cross Jesus returns good for evil and becomes a model for us to do the same thing. But what I want to talk about is that uh, with Doran's greater psychoanalytical background, he gets inside the dynamics of how the cross saves us as a symbol and even how as me messengers of the cross we become cooperators in the redemption of history. In brief, the, he talks about how victimization occurs in our youth. Sexual abuse is in the environment these days, so we're, we're, not, we're not far from these issues here. But we're all actually harmed from our youth, even if the sexually abused is the most extreme case. The, uh, so we have defense mechanisms. The only cure for the woundedness that we feel is unconditional love. The, uh, but we set up defense mechanisms because we're just too afraid of taking the risk that we might be healed and then let down. Uh, we find it impossible to accept the sincerity of the person offering us unconditional love. Up to the point where we're capable of committing violence to, uh, uh, because we have so defended ourselves uh, to uh, reject the person that is offering unconditional love to us. I invite you to think, this is a, a dream kind of analysis. This is a symbolic uh, uh, discourse I'm now involved with that Bob Doran gives. Uh, imagine you're the, um, the good thief crucified beside Jesus. The, uh, you have been in this compulsive bad behavior uh, and you've got your just rewards. Uh, along comes Jesus and you say, truly this is a good man and he's definitely dying. Now I can accept there is an, an offer of unconditional love here that is not uh, insincere. The switch gospel, uh, uh, Mark, uh, the centurion at the fo foot of the cross, truly this was a just man. So the, uh, the image of the cross as the unconditional love up to the end, whereby it accepts the rejection that we who are too hurt to accept it, uh, apply to it. However, there's one even worse bit of news. I invite you to imagine that we are also the soldiers who hit the nails into the hands of Christ. It's not all victimization uh, or misbehavior. There is sin in the world and we participate in it. So symbolically, we are both the soldier that ha hammers the nail into Christ's uh, 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 hands and the good thief who is promised today you will be in paradise with me. So, and this all is made understandable by the resurrection. So it's the resurrection of Christ that helps us make meaning of suffering and equips us then to become a, um, a, what somebody called the wounded healer. There is this paradox whereby we're not perfect overnight, uh, but there's a process that we who are wounded are nevertheless significantly in a process of healing. And we have this paradoxical deep desire to spot other people who are up to the same funny business that we have been until recently, violent and otherwise. So uh, who, who spoke about the wounded healer? No. Uh, uh, of course, he, he wrote a book of that title. But who spoke first? Who, who was Harry, Henry Nouwen quoting? It's Carl Jung. 
uh, Carl Jung coined the term, and uh, Henry Nouwen, who's, well, our generation, with due respect, uh, immediately recognised the book, The Wounded Healer, a ma- mas- masterpiece of spiritual writing. Uh, so um, Bob Doran uses Jung a great deal. Uh, at the, so, um, but anyway, the, in a, I could almost finish now. You see what I'm getting at? Uh, the the, the complementing this more strictly Lonergan view, uh, is slightly rational, uh, understand the person you're in conflict with, etc. There's all sorts of room to move from a notion of psychic conversion to a sense of being wounded healers, being able to negotiate symbols that inhabit people uh, in conflict. In a certain sense, the way I've just been talking symbolically about how do you work with the, uh, uh, the, cr- the cross as, as a symbol that motivates us. So uh, the um, attending to the psyche to feelings and dreams, clear up blockages to self-transcendence, uh, passionateness of being, and aesthetic discernment of life choices. Applied, however, to uh, the, um, the process of active nonviolence. And I'm really not going into further detail, because uh, you know, I haven't done the work. Uh, but there would be you know, a second book to be written, expanding what's here, I think, with uh, the um, insights that come from psychic conversion, psychic conversion. For example, treating what is the symbol system that inhabits the mind of, of the people in, in conflict. Uh, it's not just where did I make mistakes of judgment and decision. It's also how do I need to adopt new symbols, different symbols, uh, as, as motivating me. Um, so healing only occurs with grace. I want to go back to that point. Uh, it can't be only secular. Now, we're all in favour of the uh, social doctrine of the church, etc. Uh, we uh, we're not talking about grace as exclusive to the Christianity or to the Catholic Church. But we believe, nonetheless, something that most other people wouldn't know, which is, in fact, the, what's happening is that they are being graced in some way, part, mysterious way, participating in the cross and resurrection of, of Christ whenever they are capable of reconciling and returning decline to uh, uh, progress. Unconditional love and self-sacrifice, Christ, the perfect scapegoat. Those of you that have some philosophical background will recognize no small amount of René Girard in the account that Doran makes of, of, of this. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we've already seen our um, students go away, but I'll be staying for questions.